that this is the Curatorial Knits Knitting Podcast. I am a knitter and art curator and mom and wife. I live in the very, very sunny today Bay Area of Northern California, and I am really, really excited to be here and to be back to talk about my knitting practice and my knitting projects and all the choices and decisions um, curatorial or not, that go into making knits and hand knitting. So if it's your first time here, welcome. That's a little, little tiny spiel about me, and I hope we'll get to know each other a little bit better. And if you're returning, thank you so much for coming back. I know it's been a while, and I'm just really, really delighted to be here. It's a very busy, full season of my life right now, and I really do love carving out the time to share and to um, focus on the things that I'm making because it really does help fill my cup. So thank you for sharing that experience with me. And it may be a little bit rough or rocky. I can feel that this isn't as maybe natural as I usually am because it's been such a long time since I last podcasted. So thanks for sticking with me. If you're curious about all of the things that are making my life feel super full. Um, I might talk about those just at the end if we have time. Um, but for now, why don't we just get straight to the knits? So I have a little list here. I want to talk about some of my finished objects. I, in my last kind of proper knitting podcast, not the last, the last video I made was everything that I made was a kind of summary of all the garments that I made for myself in 2023. Um, before that though, at the end of last year, at the end of 2023, I did a kind of summary and appraisal of all of the ongoing whips or works in progress that I was currently maintaining. Some were in hibernation. Um, and I did a kind of what I called my whip down just to get a sense of the universe of all these projects. Some of which I hadn't worked on in almost a year. And so, when I go through my whips today, I will talk about all of the current whips that, and that includes everything in that universe. It's much smaller than it was, I'm very, very happy to say, um, but it is something that I want to stay on top of um, because I do want to finish off this year of 2024 with clean needles. That's my goal, is to really have a sense of kind of finalization and completion on the year. And I think so far it's looking like that might be possible. Um, I do have a few exciting things that I'm looking forward to casting on. Um, and I did kind of add something new to the mix um, based on a test knit, I know. But I really am excited with the way things are going and the different types of knitting that I'm able to do. So um, sorry if this is a lot really fast, but... One thing that I think is pretty cool and that I like talking and thinking about is having different kinds of knitting going at the same time. So while there's part of me that always aspires to be a monogamous knitter and just really focus on one project from cast on to bind off, that just isn't who I am because I feel like there's different types of knitting that I want to use in different moments of my life. And so that's what we'll talk about a little bit more in the whip down. Um, where I want to focus now is on my finished objects, the first of which I'm wearing. Um, this is not the first object I finished in 2023, um, but it was the first I cast on. So I cast this on, this is the Fortune Sweater by Petite Knit, and I think it took me a while to realize that it was called the Fortune Sweater because there are four leaf clover symbols, these little, um, little kind of flower looking things um, are lucky. So we just had St. Patrick's Day here, um, the St. Patrick's Day celebration yesterday. And so I thought it was kind of apropos to wear my fortune or lucky, uh, slightly green, I would say for sure, sweater um, today. And yes, I knit this. It's called, it, this, the pattern is by, I mentioned by Petite Knit. It calls for two strands of mohair. Now I knit mine in one strand of mohair, which was Isiger's mohair, and it was color number 67. 
And the other strand I used for my stash, and that was the Explore Knits and Fibers Spring um, Equinox Collection or Spring Tonals Collection from two years ago. So that color was called Arctic, and I've used it in a couple other applications. I really, really love it. And I have to say, I was a little, I want to say I was nervous about using the two different mediums together, but I kind of wasn't. I just thought they worked really well color-wise, and I wasn't really thinking through the fact that they were two different materials. Obviously, both spun around a silk core, but it worked out really, really well because I think for me, the Surrey brings that really, really ultra softness of the alpaca, alpaca. Um, but then when you're using the silk with the mohair, I find particularly with Issachar's mohair, the shine from the silk core really, really comes through. So I was able to get a really, I think, nice marl. The tones really kind of shift a little teeny bit. Um, and I'll put in a photo of me maybe here um, wearing it. I actually knit this specifically as an outfit. I saw this really beautiful skirt um, from Ace and Jake and I knew I wanted to wear it for an event that my husband and I do every year or had done every year and then took a long break during the pandemic and then had our first one again. Um, it's a burn supper, which is a Scottish celebration. Um, I'm sure all of my viewers and I know from looking at the metrics that there are a lot of you guys from the British Isles, so you're very familiar, I'm sure. Um, if you're not, a uh, burn supper is a night of celebrating the poetry and the life and work of the Scottish poet Robert Burns. And my husband is of Scottish descent and I have Scottish ancestors as well. And so it was just something that we used to do. We started doing it when we were in New York. Um, we were living there in our 20s and we initially started because it was not a joke, um, but the very first time that Scott came to, my husband Scott came to meet my family what, and met my kind of family's extended world was at their burn supper and so we thought why not give it a go and see what our friends um want to read and recite and how they want to contribute so it has been a really beautiful kind of touchstone in our relationship and in our lives we started doing it before we even got married and having kids um i have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old and almost all of our friends also have children, definitely makes it a little more complicated. Um, we didn't have people kind of staying till two in the morning, um, just lounging by the fireplace and picking up books of, of sonnets and reading them aloud, which has happened in other um, iterations of the event. Uh, people had, you know, babysitters to go back to, but it was a really, really special night and I, anyway, had found this skirt that I thought was a really, not in any way traditional Scottish plaid, but had a kind of really fun, playful um, riff on the idea of a tartan skirt. And I wanted to knit a sweater to go with it. So that's the sweater. I knit this fairly quickly. I cast it on on New Year's Day. Our event was on the 27th of January. And I, fo I was focusing primarily on this and my next finished object, which I will show you. Anyway, I would say as kind of a summary, I love this. <laughs> um, I absolutely want to make more. I will probably, may or may not be doing the clover um, lace pattern. I really like it for this application, but I would use this um, this pattern regardless if I ever wanted to do another um, just floofy, you know, lots of positive ease, but slightly cropped sweater. Um, I did make the arms kind of a bracelet length, which I think is, per or not bracelet length, basically three quarter length, because um, I think it goes really well with the skirt and also it leaves my hands really free. Um, when we were, we hosted for, um, I think it was 24 people. So we were very active <laughs> throughout the evening. So this was a really perfect thing to, to wear during that festivity. The next finished object is part of my whip down and I'm so, so glad that I finished it off. 
This is the Guernsey Gensler from San Nascarn, and it's from the Soft for Women catalog that they published. I bought mine from Mother Knitter here in the US, and that's also where I got the yarn. I love this. Sorry if you didn't hear that. <laughs> I just put the sweater over my face. I love it. I love wearing it. I think it's um, a really beautiful statement piece. You might remember that I the pattern calls for one strand of the double Sunday from Santa's Guard and then one sand, one strand of their tin silk mohair. I find their tin silk mohair to be very thick. I used it in my Marseille sweater that I knit last year, and while I really there's some things I appreciate about that. I did not want that much thick fluff going on, especially with the roundness of the double Sunday. So what I did is I used a um, alpaca uh, called alpaca teened, and that is also from Santa Scarn. And um, both of them came in the color putty, which is a cool kind of taupey off white. And I love it. Um, mine is, is mine cropped? I think mine is slightly, but I, I did bring it in a couple of times along the side here because that's how I like to knit my sweaters. I have a really short torso, so I find that pieces that go too far wide, too far down, end up looking more like dresses um, and less like a, a sweater even when they're oversized. So bringing them in just a little bit helps, um, I think, in my ability to style these pieces. Um, and in terms of styling, I was really excited. I had this idea that I was going to wear this, you know, off-white cabled sweater with a pleated kind of sporty, like, very polo Ralph Lauren look, um, like, but like early 90s, um, like a 90s Ralph Lauren vibe. And I found a great skirt um, that did just that from Cezanne. So I'll try to post another um, or put up another photo here um, that I think that was like the idea for the outfit. <laughs> um, and I was able to kind of execute that. I didn't used to wear a lot of skirts, and then knitting this sweater and this sweater has really helped me kind of expand my skirt world. Um, you know, I'm really used to wearing kind of wide leg um, long pants for work or jeans um, or even kind of more tailored um, tailored pants, uh, but I really, really loved the uh, skirts that I was wearing with these two finished objects, especially this past month. So those are my two finished garments for the year so far. I did finish both of them in January, which made me feel like quite proud of myself. Um, and then the rest of my finished objects are hats, and um, or there's two hats that I want to talk to you about. Um, and this was kind of a surprise. So I think I may have mentioned in the past that I'm part of a really amazing group of women. Um, we don't really have a name for these kind of salon style meetings that we have. We just call it women's group. Um, and they are really kind of an amazing group of eclectic women in my world. Um, most of them are here in the East Bay, um, in Oakland or Berkeley. Some are still in San Francisco or um, in the Far East Bay or in Marin. Um, and, but we all gather about once a month and share around a particular topic. And that has that topic has really ranged very widely from like very politically engaged activism to flower arranging to um, I have an amazing friend who is a corporate leadership coach who's worked with like incredible global CEOs and she's done incredible kind of coaching with us. Um, I have another, another great friend who is a professional organizer who's like been on the Today Show and she has a really, really amazing kind of resources that she's kind of led us through. And I've led a couple different conversations with this group but I almost always bring my knitting when I go to women's group. And the last women's group that we had, um, we had a 
um, kind of secret Santa style thing and I brought this hat and it was um, the Roku hat um, and I had knit it and it was passed around um, I've showed it on the podcast obviously I don't have it um, with me now but um, it was traded back and forth quite often and it was the kind of most sought after gift at the event and so as we were kind of departing that night um, my friend said well we should really all learn how to knit and I said ha 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 of course I'd love to teach you and then this group of women takes these things very seriously and they said great you're on the calendar for February so um, it was the day after Valentine's Day um, I was going to be teaching 14 like we sent around an email 14 women signed up to learn how to knit a hat. So um, I will say I love biting off, you know, a, more than I can chew sometimes. And at first I was like, oh, absolutely. This will be super, super straightforward. Um, I sent everyone a list of kind of where I would buy yarn for, for them. I bought everyone um, their needles, circular needles and double sided point of needles. I sent everyone tutorials on, you know, knit and purl. And I was just like, absolutely, this is gonna be amazing. Um, and then I started thinking about patterns. And the Roku hat is lovely and I really like that pattern, but it is for a DK weight yarn, I believe. Um, and I liked the decreases at the top, but it still left that weird, I kind of had to make some modifications because um, I don't love a floppy tip. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know a better way to say this, but I don't love a hat with a floppy tip. It's just, it's just not for me. And I know that's a vibe and people are really into it. I like having a little bit of extra fabric at the end um, or at the crown, but I don't like it to be like floppy. So one of the things that I did with the kind of modifying the Roku hat is I sped up some of the decreases and then slowed them down and then sped them up again. Um, and then I also held, um, I knit it at a tighter gauge and held a um, Surrey alpaca with it. And that was really, I think, helpful in kind of bringing everything together and making a tighter fabric. And so I was thinking through, okay, what, what pattern are we going to make for this hat? And should I have everyone buy a pattern? I was looking at um, not just the Roku hat, there were like five or six patterns that I was looking at us all doing. Some of them were free, some of them were paid for but none of them were actually gonna make the hat that I had made at this event. And I really wanted people to be able to use worsted weight yarn because I do believe that, that when you're learning, the thicker the yarn, just the easier and faster your results are. And I think it can be really, really helpful. And so I kind of just realized about two weeks out, um, like, right around the 1st of February that I was going to have to make a pattern for this event. And I was kind of nervous about it, um, but excited too, because I've never written out um, instructions of any kind. Um, anyone who's checked out my Ravelry page knows I don't do a lot of note taking about the modifications that I make. So what I had to do was um, make some samples. So I had pointed everyone to, as I think I mentioned, ritual dyes, and I asked them to pick out colors of the Elder, which is a worsted weight Rambouillet yarn, which I love, and I think um, comes in a really beautiful, bright, but sophisticated palette, which seemed like a really good fit for the group. Um, maybe I'll put in a picture here of all the colors people selected, because that was really fun. And then I have so many mohair scraps. Um, I did a massive yarn cabinet muck out actually um, and was really kind of overwhelmed by how much mohair scrap I had. So I figured I would just bring all of those mohair pieces and people could pick things that matched their yarn, which actually ended up going beautifully. So I'm really happy that that, that all worked out. Um, and so I had the materials and I knew I had an idea of what kind of gauge I wanted. 
Um, but I had to really start from scratch in terms of how many stitches to cast on. Um, and one thing that I was really excited about is all of the other hat patterns I have seen usually have um, just four sets of decreases if they do um, like a, um, a symmetrical decrease rate. But I really thought it would be pretty to add two more in to create a um, kind of more like a star on the top. So this is actually a six um, sectioned decrease at the top of the hat, which I really, really love. And what that does too is that because there's more, the decreases come more often, um, it just creates a much kind of, I think, more even and, and rounded top. Um, I made two samples. <laughs> This is the first one. It's a little bit imperfect, especially that my crown shaping is just not as on. Um, but I really, really love the color. Uh, and again, this is the ritual dyes that I bought um, when I was in um, when I was in Portland. And it this is the color way uh, forget me not. Yes. And then this is jewel weed which I love, and they're paired with their um, matching mohair strands as well. Um, I'll try them on because they're kind of fun. So you can see this one still has quite a bit of room at the top, but it's not flopping. It's not like moving anywhere, and that's because the gauge is tighter, um, and so you're able to kind of create a denser fabric. It's also really, really warm, and I think um, a tighter gauged rib is just my preference because also then it looks, you you really kind of can't see the purl stitches. It looks much more like stockinette um, when it's knit at that kind of tighter gauge. And yeah, it was, it was definitely an experience. I really, really got kind of nervous actually as I was printing out all of these PDFs that I had made with like, a little picture of the hats <laughs> um, and I will say I also I made a tutorial on how to do the decreases um, for them that I had that I made literally the day that we had the event in the evening uh, and that was that was harder than I thought it would be I was like really flustered um, but I'm really really happy with it and so this was February I said 15th right um, yeah, so it was February 15th that we held the event, and I think three people are done with their hats, which is super, super exciting. Um, I have two friends who have now completely fallen down the knitting rabbit hole, which was like, let's be honest, my ultimate goal um, was just basically um, being an evangelist for knitting at all, and it was it was really really great. I'm really really happy that I did it. It was um, like I said, one of those things that was like, oh, great idea, haha, and then turned into you know a pretty big project <laughs> that stretched me um, in lots of different ways, and I'm really glad I got to do it. And I have to. Um, really beautiful, squishy, yummy hats uh, out of the experience as well, of course. Um, like I said, I've actually now been fielding lots of knitting questions via text message. Um, one gal has cast on a new hat. Another has started her first sweater, which is super exciting. And um, another person actually cast on a, a hat, the same hat in the same pattern for her husband. So um, it's pretty cool. I have a pattern out in the world, even if it's just to, you know, my community. I have been thinking and wondering if it's something that I should just load um, into Ravelry. Um, it is definitely kind of my new, I love the recipe. I think it's, um, it's a really great um, everyday hat. I did grade it for three sizes. Um, and I suppose, um, I don't know if 14 people is an appropriate number for a test knit, but, um, technically I suppose it has been test knit. <laughs> um, so this is something I'd actually really, really love some input, input on. Um, I tend to kind of worry that something this simple, um, wouldn't, I, I don't know if it's, if there's like a sense of need or desire, um, if it's something that 
would be helpful for folks or that they would want to seek out. I am not a professional knitwear designer. Um, I just uh, literally made this for my friends to learn how to do knits and pearls. And um, yeah, so this is something, like I said, I would love some feedback on if you all would would be curious to see it or um, have any suggestions. If you've published a pattern on Ravelry or somewhere else, so one of the things I think that's stopping me from, from just saying, yeah, let me just publish it on Ravelry, no big deal, is that I know some folks don't have access to that. And so then my next thought is, okay, well, I need to make sure that there's accessibility, so I need to publish this somewhere else as well. Um, if you have recommendations on where that should be, uh, I don't want to you know, start a whole website for this <laughs> or anything like that, um, it then starts to feel kind of more and more daunting. So I would love some feedback. <laughs> if you have um, public self-published any knitting patterns and have any advice or recommendations, I would really, really love uh, to hear that in the comments below. Um, or if you have any feedback, um, you know, positive or otherwise about um, hat patterns in general if there's if you're like oh there's so many of them you know I'm I'm fine I'm good let me know if this is something that you think would be interesting to have on offer um, that would be helpful to know as well and yeah so those are my FOs for 2024 and it's March it's mid-March it's March 18th today and um, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Two sweaters, two hats, feels good. And now we can get into the whip down. And I will say, I was really hoping, I was really hoping that, it, that there was some sort of world when I was gonna have a third FO for this. But that we are not living in that world. Um, this is the Lauder which is a yet to be published pattern, but we're only two days out from it. Yes, I have given myself two days to knit an entire all over cable work sleeve. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I love it. Um, so this was the impromptu knit. This was not a planned knit. This is a, um, you know, I was gonna say like 11 p.m. Instagram link clicked, but I don't think that's true. I think I was actually, I think my husband was driving us around at some point at like 10 a.m. on a Saturday, like doing kid, you know, lessons, activities, nonsense. And I saw the Instagram post from Rebecca Klo of the Crayavea Knitting Podcast and I thought, well, there's no way. I mean, I would love to do that though. And my instant thought was I could do it in my light pink, either Nutidin or the light pink Bisha Bouche that I've had, both of which I've had in stash for over a year. And, you know, I won't have to buy any more yarn. I, I just instantly saw in my head the all over cables in this very light pink. So, of course, I ended up getting into the test knit, and I'm so glad I did. I love this construction. If you've seen any of my content about my stick season sweater, which I also kind of test knit, but more kind of sneaky preview knit, um, another one of Rebecca's patterns, one of the reasons I wanted to, to knit this is that I had seen her discussing the shoulder construction being similar. and. I love this shoulder construction. It is one of my, it's what makes my stick season sweater one of my most worn knits. And I just think it fits me really, really well. I have to say that this is a real labor of love project. Um, I have knit another all over cable knit sweater, but there's some really distinguishing features from that make this a more, I will say, intense knit. The first is that the cables are on the sleeves, <laughs> which I'm realizing makes a really big difference. It's so many cables. And the other is that the cables cross a lot more often. So in my other cable knit sweater, which is the, it's 
by Tete Lutzak, um, which I also test knit, and I forget the name of it, but it's delightful. Um, but the cables get bigger and bigger as it goes, as the garment um, progresses, it's top down as well. Um, but and as your cables grow, the space between your cross, the space between your crossings also increases, I believe, or your rate of crossing um, and kind of making the cables is much more inward chill. Um, this is this is doing a cable cross every um, I think it's three every fourth row, so that's pretty frequent. Um, particularly when you're on the sleeves. I will say one of my favorite details of this piece is how Rebecca's leads you to create the outline of the garment with the cables. So not only do you get to see that really beautifully done on the shoulder, but you can also see it, it, it's mirrored on um, the v-neck as well. Um, there are some things that make this challenging besides um, the intensity of the cables. I will say the first is the shoulder shaping, which is again why I love this pattern, but it, take, it took me quite a bit um, of concentration in order to do the short rows in pattern. Um, that's not explicitly laid out for each size, so you just keep doing what you need to do. <laughs> Um, as you're doing short rows. So short row shapings in cable pattern is something that I had never done before and definitely had some trial and error there. I ripped out quite a few times before I got that exact. Um, I will also say that I did my first sleeve decreases incorrectly. That was completely on me. I was not reading the, pro the pattern properly. Um, there's a really elegant solution to how uh, Rebecca has you shape the underarm as you decrease, um, but I kind of screwed that up. So I would just say pay really close attention to both that shoulder shaping short rows, which make the garment fit so wonderfully. Um, and then again, um, just follow her lead on the decreases on the underarm. Besides that, it is a really beautiful construction that is very intuitive if you've done any other drop shoulder designs. Um, and I have to say, I also really like the V-neck. I have my easy V and then this, and those are the only two V-necks. I also don't think I was is that right? I had signed up initially for the crew neck and then I, the, the, the way that the sh this was shaping, um, I really wanted to do the v-neck. So I, so that was at first a bit of a mistake. I thought I was doing it, um, but it all's well that ends well. And I'm really, really glad I have it. I don't know if I'm going to really honestly be able to finish this entire sleeve in two days. Um, I do still need to sleep, but I do have all my yarn estimates because I know how much yarn I used on this sleeve. So I've done all the math and been able to fill out the um, tester form for Rebecca so that can help um, on her and her publishing. I'm really, really excited. I think this is definitely like my Easter sweater. Oh, have I talked about yarn? I have not yet talked about yarn. Okay. I am making this in stash yarn and I'm so excited about that, first of all, because I love this yarn and I've been wanting to use it, um, but I just didn't have a, the right project for it. I had initially purchased it. This is the Biche Bush um, Le Petit Lamb's Wool. I had originally purchased it with the idea of doing Caitlin Hunter's, um, oh shoot, it's a floral pattern. <laughs> that doesn't help, I know. Um, but I had purchased it at the Rose City Yarn Crawl in 2022, um, two years ago, and it just was way too thin to get gauge with the other yarn that I had hoped to use with that. So I ended up just kind of keeping it in stash. And then I realized that if I held it double, that I could absolutely get gauge for this sweater. Then I kind of, in part of my massive yarn cabinet muck around, I encountered this incredible, incredible thing. This is the 
um, cashmere plume yarn, which I had originally bought to do sections of a t-shirt and stripes maybe with. Um, at least that had been the idea. And I had purchased this after I had gotten it um, for the um, Andrea Mowry's Rhinebeck sweater from 2022 as well. And so I had this bumming around in stash and I had two of them. I got a third just in case. I'm not even, sh and I, I did crack into it. So I will, I will have used um, two, probably two and a half, but there's a ton of yardage on these. Um, I was a little bit worried about dye lots because I had purchased this so long ago. And then I purchased the new one. Um, so that's why you see I, I kept one of the original dye lots here just in case I needed it to, um, to do the collar in case it was too uh, big of a change. But I used it entirely on this sleeve and I think you can tell there's, there's I can't tell any sort of difference um, in tone. Um, and yeah, the dye lots from Bichet Bush were all the same because I bought everything <laughs> two years ago. I am really, really happy with this fabric as well. It feels amazing. It's not super lightweight, obviously. Um, it's two, it's, you know, basically three strands together. Um, but I know that it blocks out beautifully. My swatch is not in my swatch pile. Um, it's floating around here somewhere. Um, and my swatch got super drapey. So I will say one of the things that kind of keeps me plugging along on this is that I cannot wait to see what it looks like blocked. Also, I will say we have a really, really cool tester chat um, in the in Instagram and everyone's FOs are just so inspiring. It's really, really something else. Um, and that's one of the reasons I love doing test knits is that it's, it's this really kind of special little group and community and I'm super, super delighted to always kind of check in with people and see where they are in their process. Um, and, and also of course provide feedback when helpful or necessary. So that's the lotter, and if you haven't already seen it around um, in on Instagram or YouTube, one of the things that's really exciting about the pattern is that it comes in a bunch of different variations. So Rebecca has a crew neck, a V-neck, a cardigan crew neck or V-neck, or a vest crew neck or V-neck. So first of all, I just think that's so impressive, um, but. Second of all, I think it's really generous. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I have 100% seen designers who figure out kind of one stitch pattern or one kind of, I don't know, motif or idea, and then they release four separate patterns for that motif. And what Rebecca is basically doing, I think, is really again generous because you're just purchase making one purchase, which I think is great off the bat. But the other thing that it does is that it's such an invitation. Um, it's such an invitation into craft being something that you can modify. It's really empowering. It's saying like you're in charge of your knitting. And while it's a little bit maybe not as handholdy as having four separate versions, or in this case it would be I guess six separate patterns, instead it's like an invitation to play. It's saying you're in charge of your knitting. You have, you can pick a, you know, car, you could even, and she mentioned this, I think, um, herself, like if you wanted to modify it even more, you could do a vest that was a cardigan, right? You can pick and choose these different parts of um, the pattern to really kind of make what you want and to make it your own. And so in addition to the kind of generous spirit of it and the really fun way that you can see the changes that those different stylistic mods kind of make in a, the final product. I also just think it's a really important and kind of exciting moment um, to invite people into the process. So love my lotter, loved this, loving this test knit, really kind of ready for it to be done. And I just have to knit, knit, knit this sleeve and then I'll be set to check. So that's my first um, whip. Next up, I have 
a kind of cool project that was a bit of a surprise to me. As I was working on that, I really missed the kind of just raglan in the round of, um, of this piece of my fortune sweater. And I, at the end of last year, bought myself some really special hand dyed yarn from Chelsea Fiber Co. Um, this is her 100% alpaca DK and it is really amazing. This is called Stilettos and Jeans, um, which I used to wear <laughs> pretty often. The stilettos are out, the jeans are still in, babe. Um, now it's more like uh, clogs and, and jeans, but you know, maybe someday. Um, so I have this really great um, gray with navy and kind of copper tones. And it also has, I mean, it has a really nice kind of blue, steel blue undertone to it. And I'm holding that with the very last of my Explorer Knits and Fibers Surrey. And this is the color Cliffs of Moor. And it's a really, really beautiful variegated, highly variegated gray. And the pattern that I wanted to make was going to be like a fun, easy raglan was my idea. And I'd been wanting to make the um, My Favorite Things Knitwears uh, sweater number 18, I think it is, where the collar ribbing turns into, it's a two by two collar, and then that ribbing itself turns into the raglan stitches. But when I went back and looked at it, first of all, there is some kind of weird sizing issues and I haven't knit any of her other patterns before so I was kind of nervous about the sizing. Um, and then the other thing I noticed is that it isn't exactly two, it's it's like a two by two rib and then it turns into a one by one around the raglan. But I had noticed that, did I bring it? Um, I don't think so, but the Lou sweater in the um, Sandiscarn catalog, which is the same catalog I use to make, yeah, here it is, the Guernsey Gensler. Um, there's a pattern in there that also has a two by two rib that turns into a two sets of two by two raglan stitches coming down. So what I decided to do was kind of Frankenstein these two things together. Um, and so, da, 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 I have a very kind of deep, oversized, chunky knit. This is, again, with a one strand of a thick DK and then one strand of Surrey Alpaca. Um, and it has a pretty high turtleneck. And then you can see I've just taken that um, two by two rib straight down into, um, with, one, with one kind of continuous cable going down the raglan there. And now I'm at a decision point with this. I love how easy and like just mindless knitting it is. And it's very, um, what's it called? Uh, like motivating because I'm going to be done soon. <laughs> um, so that's really great. But now I'm at this place where I have to decide if I'm going to, I'm, I've kept the ribbing going down the side here. And now I have to decide if I'm going to split the um, seam and do a kind of a split seam on the sides or not. And I really can't decide. So I actually haven't worked on this in a couple of weeks because I got to that point and then kind of decided I didn't know what I wanted. <laughs> and so I've just let it go. Um, uh, yeah, so I either have to split now and then I'll make the back much longer than the front. Um, or not much longer, maybe like an inch and a half, maybe two inches longer in the back than the front. Um, or I just kind of keep it going and do a really thick rib on the bottom. That's my other kind of option. So if you have a wide two by two split seam sweater that you love, Tell me about it, because I've been looking at a lot of Ravelry projects <laughs> trying to make this choice. So um, 
hopefully I can figure that out and get this done um, and wear it in the early mornings when it's foggy and I'm on the school run. And so those are kind of the most um, active current whips. The other thing I've made quite a bit of progress on, though not where I really should be, um, is my twigs. So this is by Junko Okamoto. Um, this is the twigs sweater that I cast on for my birthday, which is about to be a year. I only have the big motif at the bottom left to do. I still love, love, love the yarn. I think I one of the things that I ran out of steam with this project though is that I've realized just how um, nervous I am. <laughs> how nervous I am um, about the fit and the gauge, to be honest. I probably, not probably, I really should have dropped down even more needle sizes to cinch together um, the straight knitting in between the color work sections. I will say though, I don't think I've mentioned um, my kind of loose gauge recently, or at least in this podcast, because I have been really working on some of the tips from um, Patty Lyons, which I really, really encourage folks to do. Um, I've been hearing more and more knitters talking about um, their gauge being quite loose, and specifically, um, the Nitty Stew podcast recently mentioned that she noticed a really big difference when she moved on to metal needles. And the thing that's really, really helped me that Patty Lyons recommended is just to remember to knit at the tips of my needles, <laughs> which I know seems maybe very obvious, but I think that a lot of times I was grabbing, the thing with these metal needles is because they're so slippery, you can grab the yarn fairly kind of low down off the tip. Like sometimes I grab, I'm grabbing the yarn all the way down he like here. I don't know if you can see that or if this is helpful if I look like an insane person. Um, but like almost an inch down onto the needle, the kind of body of the needle. And she just had one really kind of helpful video and reminder. And this is all for free on her um, website which was just to knit at the top of your needle and keep moving the stitches up to that, to the tip of your needle. And as soon as I've started doing that, I've really seen my gauge get so much more consistent as well as tighter. So it's not just that I was personally looking to like tighten up my gauge because I didn't like using small needles, which is still a thing, <laughs> um, I, which I, I, totally think is helpful to, to recognize. Um, but it was also because I found that the loose, when I have a super loose gauge, my, my tension isn't always as nice as I would like it to be. And I really do want to kind of make um, gains in that so things look really kind of clean and even. Um, and I don't have to always feel like, oh, it'll block out or, or rely on my blocking as, as heavily. Um, so yeah, moving all my stitches up to the tip of the needle as I'm knitting them and making sure that that action is happening um, closer to the narrowest part of the needle instead of down on kind of like the body of the needle where it's at its thickest point has been really helpful for me. I do wish I had been doing that a year ago <laughs> when I first started this project, but um, I do still really want it to be done by my birthday this year, which I think is doable. My hope and plan is to have both of those big sweaters done by the end of March. And so then this will be um, really my focus in April so I can finish it off before my birthday in May. So that'll be good. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned this this time. Um, I'm using the Lavandula uh, Chic Blend, which is a really amazing yarn from Italy. It is a combination of uh, fine wool and mohair, and it has an incredible shine to it. It blooms up beautifully. I really, really love their color sense. It's all hand dyed, and I recommend it 
1000%. It's a really, really beautiful yarn to work with. Um, and I'm really, really glad that that's what I'm doing. I just need to finish it. <laughs> um, keeping going with the whip down. I also like somewhat tragically, but also sanely, um, ripped back my husband's, um, high lonesome sweater, which has been on my needles since last summer. I ripped it back to the split for sleeves because I was messing around with the gauge. Um, the main color I'm using here is Good Wool from Pearl Soho. And I was really worried, I was knitting it on size sixes, and I was really worried that it was getting to, um, that the fabric was really gonna be too loose. And it was fine for the color work. Um, and then I was moving on to the body and I made a very weird choice um, that I kind of can't believe I wasn't yelled at about in the comments because I feel like I would be silently yelling at myself, um, which is that I was like, oh, I'll hold it double for the body. But of course, wouldn't that make the body like twice as big? What was I thinking? Um, I guess I was thinking I would drop down a bunch of needle sizes and that that would somehow work. But instead, I'm just, again, focusing on tightening up my gauge. I drop down a needle size, I'm holding it single, and I just have like miles and miles of stockinette to do on this. Um, I'm kind of honestly saving it for a plane ride or a long car trip um, or something where I can just mindlessly knit in the round um, forever. <laughs> So that's like, that's going to be a real, um, uh, yeah, I just have to kind of not make myself do it, but the, the color work was so much fun. And now that it's just endless stockinette, I'm definitely, um, resisting this one a little bit. And then my last whip is also from my whip down abandoned project that I've really come back around to. I absolutely adore it. And that's my satellite shawl by Andrea Mowry. And I cast this on in, also in 2022. Um, and I just, I love it. I don't, I'm, I'm really excited to just keep on keeping on with this. I did not do a great job on my eye cord down at the beginning, which has me a little nervous, but I'm just gonna block the heck out of it. I think it'll be okay. Um, and all is forgiven in uh, Shaw Land because it's so flexible. So yeah, I'm really loving being back on track with this. I honestly just had to kind of spend two minutes looking at the pattern, <laughs> which is why I feel like I had abandoned it. Um, so now I, I'm back to remembering what I'm doing in terms of these kind of pie slices and I just, I love this yarn so, so much as well. This is a um, combination of La Bienna May's Helix. And then my floofy bits are all from a verb for keeping warm here in um, Berkeley. And oh, it's just their soft current Surrey Alpaca is just one of my favorite things, as you will see shortly. Um, it's absolutely divine. I just love it so much. And this color is topaz. I'm also using their um, really deep indigo navy. Um, and all of their colors are um, botanically dyed. And then there's also this um, really nice kind of light parchmenty gray. So that's fun to be back on track with. And that's all my whips. That's the whip down, which is kind of great. I'm excited about it. Acquisitions um, are next. If that's not your jam, cool. You can skip ahead if you want to hear me talk life nonsense. Um, and if not, um, I guess toodles. If you are here for acquisitions, they were pretty reserved, I would say, for the last quarter of last year and first quarter of this year. Um, the first thing I was going to show you was, oh, the Chelsea yarn that I did get, Chelsea Lux. Um, I don't know if I showed this last podcast or not, but I really, really, really love this speckle. Um, this is my first kind of really variegated, like, like speckly 
yarn project, I think. Um, and I'm really happy with it. I think that it's turned out really well. Um, I've done a little bit of helical knitting, but now I'm just kind of like, it's worked out so well. I'm just going for it. I think it's pretty even. Um, up at the top, there's a little bit less distribution, but it's also narrower there, so it makes sense. Anyway, I really, really love it, and I highly recommend it. If you are a speckle person, you probably know all about her work. Anyway, um, the other thing I got at the end of the year is um, Nutidin. <laughs> I did another Nutidin because of this color, which is amazing. And this was their color to represent light, which I love and makes me deeply, deeply happy. And I also really, really loved the cool black. So this is the marker, the dark, and it is a true cool black and it contains sheep, um, natural black wool, and then some um, wool that has been dyed black. And then this just this blue, I couldn't not get it. It was it called to me. It's really, really beautiful. And I love um, how soft and bright it is at the same time. It has a really wonderful kind of um, soft power to it that I find really appeals. I don't know what I'm going to make with these. I've been really tempted to do another um, Junko sweater for um, the knit along with my gals, um, Jackie and Carmen from Knitting a Good Yarn. And I would really love to do a Nutidin um, Junko pattern uh, or a Junko pattern in Nutidin. And I've been going back and forth quite a bit. Um, there's a sweater dress called Pam that I've been thinking would be really beautiful as just a sweater because I'm not knitting a dress. Um, but it has corrugated ribbing at the bottom, which I think would look really, really good as a sweater as well. So um, that's something I'm considering. But no real firm thoughts on, on this um, yet. Next thing and last thing that I have is very, very recent, as in yesterday. Um, my friend Megan and I went to the Bay Air first, first ever Bay Area Yarn Crawl, and it was absolutely delightful. Um, we have a new yarn store in my area um, on College Avenue in Berkeley. Um, College Avenue is the street that it's kind of the high street. It's like right there um, from my house and you follow it all the way up to um, the clock tower at um, the University of California Berkeley which is the campus that's kind of just that way. Sorry I was cut off um, I just have a lot to say already apparently um, but I was talking about our awesome new yarn crawl for the Bay Area and how I went to a couple, um, three actually shops yesterday with my great friend Megan. We went to this first new one that I was saying was on College Avenue, which is called Imagine It, which is also based in San Francisco and they just opened last month a um, outpost here in uh, Berkeley. And that was really cool. Um, we went first though to A Verb for Keeping Warm, which is my favorite um, yarn supplier. Um, you do need to kind of make yourself known there when you're shopping if you need help. Um, and you also, they're only usually open one day a week. So it's not my favorite place to kind of physically, like it's a beautiful, beautiful store. Um, but, and their material is really extraordinary. Um, they had made a custom colorway for the event. This is the called Marine Layer, and it's a really, really beautiful variegated pinks and blues. And they have this on their flock base, which is a fantastic, fantastic, um, luxe beautiful base and then they also have an amazing new base called thistle which is made from the wool of sheeps 
that are just like foraging in the Berkeley Hills. So it's like hyper local to us. Um, that was all pre-sold. So I didn't, um, they had, I think like one skein left and it's in 50 gram skeins. It wasn't something that I could kind of initially see a project for. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to call that out because it was all really, really beautiful. Um, but I have been really excited about a new pattern coming out and Megan unfortunately just didn't meet me in time. So she left me to my own devices in a verb for keeping warm and they have some of my very, very, very favorite colors of Surrey alpaca. And the pattern I'm looking forward to is a, um, basically it's, I, I'm, I think it's one strand of mohair oh, and it's uh, basically like a striped cardigan. And I really, really would love it to wear over, over um, dresses this summer. I would, I'm looking for more cardigans in my life. I think that's kind of a mantra for a lot of people in 2024. And I really love the idea of a striped version. So my main color will be this white, which is just the undyed lighthouse color, which I love and which I've used the, um, I haven't used the Surrey um, in this color, but I've used others. And then this is a new base call from Verb called um, uh, ba, 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 sorry Wild Bloom, and this is the color is Rain Cloud, and this is again all dyed with natural indigo that they actually grow. I mean, it's an it's an amazing amazing place, um, and yes, like I said, the color is Rain Cloud. The base is alpaca silk, and then it has a small percentage of yak in it, so it's a little bit thicker. And then there was only one of these left. That's the thing. A lot of the kind of hand dyed qualities mean you just have kind of random one offs that you can see um, there. This is soft current and um, this is just a limited edition. It's from August of last year. Again, this is the same base as this alpaca here. And I really, really love it. I don't know if the tonal of this kind of maroon going into kind of a purpley gray is coming out. But my idea for this is to do kind of a sandwich of stripes. So white as the main color and then um, a stripe of blue with the purple on either side of it. And then I was thinking I could use the variegated um, color to do the button band and cuffs and ribbing. Anyway, I just knew that these things had to be together and it was a really, really fun purchase. So that was our first stop on the Bay Area Yarn Crawl. Um, then we went to Black Squirrel, which is in Berkeley and is fantastic kind of small annex type space. I had been in, that's where I bought some sock yarn that I used to make the um, Please Don't Ask cardigan last summer um, and they have really revamped a lot of their selection and they have incredible hand dyers. They have um, uh, Moonstruck fibers, they have Wandering Flock, they have really 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 beautiful local hand dyers to the Bay Area and then they also carry um, some really beautiful uh, standard yarn yarns as well. Um, the fiber company, there were a few things that I like almost bought an entire sweater of, uh, quantity of, um, yeah, just, I was really, really impressed with their selection. I feel like it has gotten much, much better in the last couple of years. And I found some mystery yarn there. So this is naturally dyed in California. It's called tactile fiber arts. Um, they have worsted question mark not sure what it is. They, I found two skeins of this and I thought this would be really great for a sweater for my four-year-old who is so, so knit worthy because he, he's just shot up. He's super, super tall, but he is quite um, thin and really, really loves to stay cozy warm in his knits. So I thought that would be a really good fit for him. So I have two skeins of this and I think that there'll definitely be enough for a vest or pullover, um, I was thinking a little v-neck one for him, um, but I might even be able 
to get away with making him a full sweater if I make it narrower, narrow enough so it'll fit him and still be long. So um, those are my acquisitions. I think we have a few quick minutes until the battery kicks out again for Life Talk. Um, some of you guys might remember that I've been working on a online course that I'm teaching on how to collect art and work in kind of more fully in the art world, particularly for interior designers and other folks who work tangentially to the art um, market. And that has been going really well. It's definitely taken up a huge, huge, huge part of my work life. Um, but not my full-time job life. Um, so it's where I'm spending a lot of evenings and weekends and um, my Mondays, which uh, usually were kind of more kind of flex days for me where I got you know meal prep stuff done and uh, knitting things and things like that. So that's kind of put a crunch on things. Um, and I'm also another thing that's making life full, but really exciting. I'm training for a half marathon. So um, I did a full marathon in 2023 uh, last year, and now I'm just gonna do a half, which is much easier in terms of time commitment to my training and is still giving me those awesome running endorphins and making me feel really accomplished and good. Um, other life stuff is great and we're just spending so much time outside now that things are starting to um, really warm up here in the Bay Area. We had so much rain and um, for us at least a lot of gloomy stormy days so now that the sun is out we're just spending as much time as we can outdoors um, playing and the kids kind of sports have really taken off too. So that's what's keeping me super busy these days. Thank you so much for spending some time with me and working through these projects together. It really is such a joy to share them with you. Please let me know in the comments below if you have any questions at all, if you have feedback regarding my hat ideas or um, especially too I'm thinking more about the sweater and whether or not I should split the seam so um, do give me your feedback I'm so looking forward to hearing from you and thank you so much um, thank you for your work in the world um, and putting just one stitch out there at a time and being yourself I appreciate you so much have a great day and happy knitting bye